mentioned the idea that, um, you know, for Xi Jinping, it's like the idea of betting the farm. Uh, one of the things that came out of the third plenum was just repeated talk of uh, Xi Jinping's central role in the CCP, the importance of Xi Jinping thought. Essentially, it seems like he's a little concerned about how much control he has moving forward with the possibility of civil unrest in China. And with the economy, what it is, do you think it could get to the point where she feels this is all going to collapse? My best bet is to bet the farm and just see how that shakes out. Uh, you know, Chris, that's 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 a possibility. I wouldn't discount that. Um, you're calling that, a, you know, it's a desperation move, maybe uh, that that pushes irrationality. Um, and that could happen. I mean, in, in what we have to remember is in the back of the minds of the senior Chinese leadership is what I call a Ceausescu moment. And they all remember the, um, the rapid and violent turn that took place, I think it was in Romania, when um, the people turned against the authoritarian leadership that was uh, uh, very, very favorable towards uh, Mao and China. And, uh, you know, within a matter of days, there were these uh, violent executions of Ceausescu and his wife. And I, I think that that's in the back of the minds. And they, when you think about China's situation today in the world, um, if you have a social uh, explosion, among the people in, in the country, where does that leadership flee to? Where do they go? Russia? Eh, maybe, maybe not. Iran? Possibly. I'm not so sure they really want to go to North Korea. So, I mean, the, the options that the leadership is looking at are not very good. And I think we always have to, 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 as we've talked about before, we have to watch the, the, the social side on this economy as to whether, how far it's going, how bad the situation is really getting. Um, and that's going to be increasingly difficult with, the, with Xi Jinping taking much tighter, tighter control of things. Yeah, it's interesting in terms of taking tighter control because he, he's talking about reform, but he's not using the definition of reform that we in the West typically associate with Deng Xiaoping's reform or the, the Gaiga Kaifeng, the reform and opening up of the late 70s and the 80s. Uh, Xi Jinping's reform seems to be taking back more of the economy under state control. That's correct. Right. But using a term that people in the West think, oh, this is great. Uh, so there's kind of maybe a lie baked into that, but is that even like, can that save the Chinese economy? Because, oh, well, you know, real estate prices are out of control. There's this real estate boom and bust, like maybe more state control will stabilize these problems, right? That, that, I mean, that must be what he's thinking. Is that gonna work? Uh, you know, here's the, here's the piece, the, the part about that math that's, that's really tricky. Um, you and I, Matt, you and I have a Western economic perspective on things. And, and we believe that there are laws of economics that operate like laws of gravity. And so you have, for instance, Adam Smith's invisible hand concept. And, uh, and what you are talking about is Xi Jinping is going... <laughs> from an invisible hand to a visible hand type control situation. And um, from the, the, the Chinese perspective, they think they're going to be doing the right thing, that uh, they, can, they can write this ship and everything is going to be just fine. Um, I personally agree with you. I don't see it. I don't see how this is, is working. And this concept of using the English word reform and the English words opening up, um, it, it, it is a misrepresentation or a lie. And so one of the things that has, has, is going on now is that the U.S.-China Business Council is leading this delegation of um, 
American multinationals that have one foot basically trapped in China uh, to try to understand what what's coming out of this third plenum and maybe to try to persuade the leadership that you really need to do a, a, a reform as we understand it. But here's where I come out on this, Matt. I think that that the party used the English language very cleverly because when they throw out the words reform and open up, that is, uh, you know, a... Uh, you know they're they're playing to Wall Street and saying you know we're 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 changing now this is this third plenum um, everything is going to be fine we're going to get back on uh, uh, on the straight and narrow and uh, let's bring that foreign direct investment coming back in and that's what we're going to see in the in the propaganda in the the months and years to come. Well, I mean that is essentially the the foreign direct investment is what has propped up China's economy for the last couple decades. And, uh, you know, hard to say what China would look like had that not happened, but it certainly wouldn't be the world's number two economy without this trillions and trillions of, of foreign direct investment. Yeah, you are absolutely right. And, so, you know, it's really interesting, Matt, if you, if you could take the investment into China coming out of the old free Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and the United States, I'm not so sure China would have progressed a whole lot from where they were at the tail end of the Cultural Revolution. Well, speaking of, I think this is a good time to talk about Enbridge. We're talking about more, Xi Jinping having more state control over the economy. China is working on something called Embridge, which stands for Multi Central Bank Digital Currency Bridge. So, what is this? Is this the ticket to save China's economy? Uh, I don't think so. I think that what this is is um, well. Let's go back. If we go back to the the uh, pre COVID era let's say the beginning of the Belt and the, where the Belt and Road was running at, at its peak. Um, one of the things that was, you know, we saw was, was the, the rise of Bitcoin. And initially the party leadership was against digital currencies. And the reason was, you know, it had a libertarian bent, the government had no control. And so the development then changed to an, E yuan. And the reason for that was that the Chinese leadership said, now, wait a second. If we have this digital currency and we run it through our central bank, we can enhance the control over our, our citizens. Meaning, if you don't do what the party says, we cut off your income, your ability to move money, your ability to eat, and so forth. We, we have ultimate control. So there was this mind shift. So now we come to this uh, Enbridge uh, facility that uh, China is, is pushing along with the central banks from Hong Kong, Thailand. Who else is in there? Hong Kong, Thailand. Uh, the UAE, I believe. UAE, correct. And um, uh, the, the idea there is to create a cross-border digital currency payment system. And uh, the most recent development that adds a little bit of fire to this is that Saudi Arabia has joined in with this. Now, to put this in perspective, this is a project that is being uh, essentially uh, under the development or supervision of, of the Bank of International Settlements based in Switzerland. And they're looking at ways that they can uh, speed up uh, the, the transfer of funds across border. Now, what we have to look at is on the China side. And one of the, the pieces that is, is important here is that China, if you all recall, is a party to the uh, regional RCEP, Regional Cooperation Economic Program or something. This is a, a essentially a free trade agreement between a number of Southeast Asian countries. 
And there is a provision in that uh, uh, agreement, trade agreement, for uh, potential digital resolution of payments across border. So the, the, the picture is that uh, maybe China would use this as a way of getting around its currency um, challenges on the open market with the fact that, that its internal currency, the renminbi within the country, is not convertible. They would use this digital currency. The reason that I said that I don't think this is going to be the, the, the big be-all and end-all is it's going to take uh, some time for other central banks to get on, on board with this, uh, and it's not going to happen quickly. Um, put it in perspective, there are some 11,000 banks on the SWIFT system. I think I have the number right, 11,000. And there are 1,500 banks uh, potentially looking at this uh, Enbridge system. So China is behind it. And I think the fact that China is behind it um, actually is a deterrent to other countries um, jumping into this system. But the Enbridge, part of the impetus for this Enbridge system, Matt, is coming back to a question that you raised earlier, is actually to help sanctions proof the Chinese economy. If they can get get around the swift sanctions imposed on Russia using digital currency transfers, then you know they've essentially built another wall around their economy. 